Welcome to Positive Talk Radio. Our goal is simple, to explore evolving ideas one conversation at a time. So stay with us as right now we present. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. I'm excited that uh, we get a great guy to talk to today. His name is John Cole. He's an artist. He is an author. He is a speaker. And he's done all of those things in coordination with uh, Allison Roberts and Behind the Power. And uh, it was, it was I understand it to be, and we were just talking before the show began, that I understand it was a great, a great experience had by all. Would you, uh, first of all, welcome to the podcast, John. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Ha- thank you for having me back on. I'm, I've been looking forward to uh, discussing the follow-up on how Behind the Power went. And of course, to have the opportunity to speak with you again. By the way, have you noticed that? Have you gone to uh, um, Instagram? Because you're you're prominently displayed there. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's impressive. Hmm. On a couple of episodes, we created a, a space for you because of the the great things that you have to talk about and wow. and what you said. So it was it was, uh, and so we've got like you know, on Instagram, we've got a bunch of episodes now. So that's really, that's really cool. And, and you are really a special dude, I gotta say. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And also I have to point out that that was the first time I've ever been introduced with the word speaker and any kind of introduction ever in my life. So hearing that, <laughs> hearing that out loud was actually pretty cool. I'm like, Hey, I guess, I guess I am a speaker in a way now, huh? Were you standing in front of a bunch of people? I absolutely was. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, were you speaking? I was indeed, sir. <laughs> Then, then you are a speaker, sir. Then I guess I am. So, you know, and uh, I want to I want to go through that with you a little bit, but let's talk about behind the power, and uh, Allison Roberts and what she did there. I understand that the the attendance was superior, and and uh, the speakers were terrific, and everybody had a really good time. Right. Yeah. We um. Uh, so there was right. There's 13 of us all together speaking. That was including Allison. So we all. As we have we spoken about in the past, we all got together and we wrote chapters in the Behind the Power, You're Not Crazy, You're Powerful book, which is thankfully finally out printed copy because I know there's a, a, a lot of us that really enjoy that smell of book, right? So yeah. that's out right now in a printed copy. But in conjunction with that, uh, we all met down at Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia for the Behind the Power event. As part of that, uh, we all had the opportunity to speak on various topics. For myself, it was codependency. For others, it might have been recovering from sexual trauma or talking about, um, you know, what personal power means to them. And the turnout really was fantastic. Um, the first year that Allison hosted it, there might have been maybe 25 people. This year, it was more than double, uh, which considering we're still at the tail end of the COVID business and people are still a little bit weary of traveling is really a substantial increase. Um, We had not only that, but we had a few other speakers, Uh, Tracy Litt, who was also a very um, notable uh, life coach. She was there and, and presented along with Allison, which was really powerful for a lot of us. And we had the opportunity also to have breakout sessions Uh, I myself had some folks come in and we talked about, you know, some of the challenges you face when you transition from a a long time career like I did, right, 36 years in the Coast Guard transitioning to something that might not be as big, like what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Uh, My wife and uh, Christy Farisi, uh, both of them have been on your show before, uh, had a breakout session to do artwork in terms of getting in touch with your inner child. Another very interesting subject great turnout for that. And um, we had a panel set up, multiple panels, as a matter of fact, where we talked through various subjects. And we had that interaction with the audience, which again, was a very powerful experience for a lot of people. Um, And all that we squeezed into three short days in Atlanta. So it just really was an amazing experience. Allison and her daughter, Laura, who acted as the MC, did an amazing job, not only keeping everybody on track, Kevin, but really bringing together such a wide variety of loving people and sincere people, you know, and, and I don't mean just the speakers, but even those that, that made that commitment to come and and really partake in this. Um, And it wasn't just members of her unapologetic power group. We're talking folks that, you know, had either through Facebook or through some other mechanism, heard about the program, decided to invest in themselves and then come in and participate. 
Uh, we got to meet some wonderful people that we had never met before. And that one thing that we all have in common is that we're all good people that really want to change our lives so that we can change and help other people. So totally wonderful event. And the beauty of it is we're going to be doing it again next year. And that's awesome, by the way. Christine says hello. Hi, Christine. And um, she was also one of the speakers. Yes, she was. And a really and really fine lady and a, a wonderful wife, I hear. Not that yep, I know. Yep. She's, she's pretty good. She's pretty good. She's been hanging around with me now for coming up on 15 years. Matter of fact, our anniversary is coming up in a few weeks in uh, November. Congratulations. 15 years is a long time. It is a very long time. But we're, we're hanging in there. That's that's really cool. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And, you know, and one of the things that you got to do was to be a speaker. Now, I want to I want to go through with you what it's like. To speak in front of a group of people, but to the moments before you get on stage, the yeah. the angst that we all go through when you are are thrust upon the public eye and uh, like that and become and to stand up in front of a bunch of people what what was going through your your stomach and your heart and your mind shortly before the uh, before you hit the stage well i think i think it's a very well known fact that public speaking is like the number one fear right um it really is yeah it really is and i'm not I'm certainly not going to argue that fact. I think as much preparation, and I can only speak on my behalf, right? But as much preparation as I put in for the speech, and that was no joke, Kevin, hours and hours of prep time, right? Didn't just include the writing, but the revisions. And of course, practicing in front of my wife, practicing in front of my colleagues as part of Unabologetic Power, practicing one-on-one -on -one with folks and just going down in the basement and reading this speech time and time again until the morning of, and I'm like, I know this thing, backwards and forwards, right? <clears throat> so of course, as the time gets closer, you start to then think what could possibly go wrong. And <laughs> well, right, you know, a whole bunch of things go through your head, right? I mean, of course, you know, yeah. You know, well, a trip going up stage. That's a, see, that's a normal reaction or response of somebody is, you know, it's like, it's not like I'm going to knock this out of the park. It's like, OK, what could go wrong? I could forget something. I could trip. I could, um, you know, a whole myriad of things could go. Somebody could start heckling me, sure. uh, all that kind of stuff. Oh, so. absolutely. You know, and, and but in my head, I'm like, you know what, John, I know this. I know this. I got this. I've said it so many times. Right. And even in my head, I'm like, I know the first sentence is long. As long as I can get past that first sentence, Kevin, I'm good. I'm golden, right? So I'm telling myself this, and right next thing you know, they, you know, next up on the stage, John Cole, and they read this little biography. So walk along. I'm hearing the applause. I'm, I'm starting to get butterflies, right? Because I'm about to step on. I get up on stage and I say that first line, and I'm like, "Oh, I got this, dude. I got this." And it's smooth sailing, smooth sailing, smooth sailing. I probably get about. Remember, this is only like a 15 minute speech, so it's not super long, right? I probably got about 10 minutes into it and I'm like, whew, I'm, I'm moving towards the finish line and I'm passionate, right? Because I know this thing really, really well. And then I get to one line and no joke, Kevin, it, I, my mind literally went Sahara desert. <laughs> it happens. It was gone. It was like just one second it was there and the next second it was gone. And of course, in those moments, it's probably the biggest terror that I could possibly think of when you're standing in front of people and your mind goes blank. So although I was told that I didn't look goofy for too long standing there, I was able to, and, and this, this really was the beauty of the moment is what I found myself, what, what ended up happening in that moment was because I couldn't think about what, I was supposed to say, I found that inside myself, I was actually able to speak from the heart mm -hmm. about the subject of codependency. And I, I actually used that, that difficult moment as a learning lesson for not only my, not only the audience, but myself. And I was very candid about it, you know, and, 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 and I haven't gone back and listened to the video again because I'm still not ready 
to listen to it, right? I'll be honest, I'm just, I'm just a little frightened to listen to it. But again, I was told it turned out well. Uh, but I do, re I do recall that in that brief moment of clarity, I, I, I felt more connected to myself and to the audience than I probably did as I was just reciting that memorized piece. So, you know, towards the end, of course, all of a sudden I remembered the end of it and I was able to pick up and, and finish. Um, but what I found really, really interesting about that experience is that I think that there's a certain there's a certain there's a certain magic that happens when you're in a position like that, when you're in front of people and you really have something that you want to say that's important. And really, all of our speeches at the core had a very important subject that we all as speakers wanted to tell the audience. And I would venture and I'm not going to put money on this, but I would venture that the majority of the speakers at some point this happened to. Oh, right. Sure. So they're reading along and, and there's and you could almost tell when you listen to people talk, it's like the conversation we're having right now. None of this is scripted. And it really sounds in my ears anyway, like a legitimate conversation as opposed to, you know, if I was reading from this book or you were reading off of a script. And I think people can tell that. And I think that conversations like this are more meaningful because they're from the heart. And I think that's what happened to me. And to be honest with you, although I was a little disappointed with my performance immediately afterwards, um, after talking to some folks and really thinking about it, um, in a way, I'm kind of glad that I went Sahara Desert on that speech, because I think ultimately it turned out to be a much better product. So, oh, I, I agree with you totally. As a matter of fact, so does Christine. Uh, she says yeah. you face it with grace and dignity. He showed Thank up you. vulnerable and knocked it out of the park. And, you know, like like I said before we began that when that happens um, and it happens to a lot of people all the time and and but but people are rooting for you that are they're in the audience. It isn't an adversarial thing. They want you to do well and 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 they feel really good when when you do knock it out of the park. Yeah, and I don't. It, it, yeah, and that's and that's a really good point that I think you know people like me that tend to feel as if we need to be perfect all the time. You know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, and that's some of the things I'm working through. Is why do I have this feeling that I need to be perfect and everything has to be just spot on, or else I'm not going to bother to do it, right? But the fact of the matter is, you're absolutely right. I don't think perfection has nothing to do with anything that we're doing because in the long run, nobody really cares if you're doing it perfect or not. What they care about is whether you're a good person and what is it you're trying to say. Exactly. You know, the only time that it was imperative that I actually follow the script mm -hmm. was when I did Shakespeare because it is so out of the English language yes. that if you don't do it correctly, and and with every line, then you're, it's gonna it's gonna come off really terribly. But other than that, no, well, other than um, that, and, and even then, Hollywood will take Shakespeare and they will rewrite it completely, and you'll watch it. It'll you know with it'll be with Sylvester Stallone, and you'll be like, oh my god, this is like this action film, and it's Shakespeare for heaven's sake, right? So, yo, Adrian, to yeah, be exactly. or not to be, yeah, exactly. So, you know, and uh, but it's a, it's important. But I, so I'm glad, you know, from an a experiential point of view, I'm glad that you had that experience yes. because it, 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 it taught you a lot. And also uh, the audience it wasn't lost on the audience, no. but they were real pleased that you were speaking from your heart and it all made sense. And that actually was better than the scripted part. I'm willing to bet. I, yeah, again, I, I didn't, I haven't yet gone back to listen to it, but it, that's probably the case. And and I think that would be, you know, next year uh, we're, we're going to have a, you know, additional folks that haven't stepped on stage before. Um, I, I would I would wager that'll be the case. I'm sure there'll be some veterans and then some new folks, but I think if anything, that would be my advice. Or I should say my support that I would provide to these folks is that, yeah, I think it's important to have a, a some kind of speech prepared, but maybe not be so tied to it that if you do find yourself in that position where, you know, the words aren't coming like you have them scripted, that you really can slide back into, into just talk about the subject 
as opposed to reciting about the subject. Because I did learn that that's really where I jam myself up. So, yeah. And, and some people, Christine said, some people even thought it was intentional. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, why would you put through yourself through that on purpose? Yeah, I know. I know. But, uh, but, but I'm, but like I said, I'm glad it turned out the way it did. I mean, ultimately, there was a ton of lessons for me and I'm, I, I feel, you know, better for it. Well, and see, that's one of the things that, that I do because, and that's why I do these live mm -hmm. is because I don't want them to be scripted. Yeah. If I make a mistake, I make a mistake and that's okay. Yeah. Um, if, if we get to, to talking about something that, that doesn't make any sense, that's okay. We, we just <laughs> do, do the best we can. I do, I do that so often, Kevin. I don't know how many times I've been in conversations and I'll even stop myself and say, what the heck am I talking about? Because it no longer even makes any sense to me. That's funny. <laughs> Well, as as we get older and have, I don't know about you, but I'm I'm at the age where uh, and a word that you, you know how your mind works, that that it just kind of shows up mm -hmm. and you think about something and it's just there. Yeah. Um, I'm getting to the point in my agedness that there are times when I call up on a word and it just doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I so, you know, and that can happen to you. Especially when you're on stage, it can absolutely happen to you. But uh, it's good to have a sense of humor about it as well, because you're right; it is what it is, and 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 people support. They will support you. So they they will. And you wrote the you, the chapter in the book that is just out. What was your chapter about? Well, my chapter it's called "A Grain of Sand," and uh, it it ties in with the speech, and and it's about the codependency issue, and where a lot of um, where I believe my codependency issues really start, right? Um, like most of us, uh, trauma kind of underpins who we are, you know, uh, and trauma doesn't have to be big. It can be very small. It can be something as simple as like for me, never being able to find anybody to like me in school. I never really had a girlfriend in school. And although that doesn't seem like a traumatic thing, it can change the way you see yourself, right? If you never have a girlfriend, then you might begin to believe that you're not good looking. That might not be the case, but you can then begin to think that you're not, right? And once you start to have these thoughts that you're not a certain way, that can carry with you. And as those things compound over the years, if they're never healed or reconciled or anything like that, um, then you begin to think about the world differently. And then when that happens, uh, it can, it can lead to some bigger problems later on. So I hated being a teenager. Oh ugh. yeah. If I ever had to go back and do it again, it would never be going back to my teenage years. I can tell you that. Oh, that was horrible. <laughs> High school years. Oh my God. The worst. It was, it was terrible because you know, you don't know what you don't know right. and until you know it. And, but in order to know it, you've got to go through it, yep. but it's scary to go through it. And, uh, you know, and it's like, and, and women don't understand what it's like to be a awkward 14, 15 year old kid with pimples and, <laughs> and, and stuff. And then to walk up to a, a group of girls and ask one of them to, to dance or to do, they don't get how much courage it takes to be able to do that. Unless you are a narcissist who thinks that, you know, those, everything rises and sets with you. But um, I, I, that was a most horrible time. Yeah. I, so it would take me hours sometimes at a dance to get the courage to, to, and then, and then they would dance and they wouldn't even look at you. It was like, Oh, well, this is kind of pointless. So, you know, but growing up, it, it's hard. Um, and so, you know, what do you do? But you, but you got through it and you got, and you married a, a lovely lady and you know, it would be nice for us if we could look at the total of our life and then go back and do it. Yeah. yeah it's kind of like they, it, if you could reverse things, right. If we were born with everything that we needed to know first, it certainly would take care of a lot of the challenges, move it along. You know what I mean? And maybe it would <laughs> exactly. clear up some of the problems that we find ourselves in now, but, um, but I mean, it's, you know, that that's, that's the interesting thing is it's never too late for any of this stuff. And, and even, even the trauma and the healing that goes along with it, it's never too late for that. And, and right. some, sometimes I think specifically the older we get, and, and I'd be the first to admit, I don't know how many times I've used that excuse. Well, I'm too old. 
right? I'm too old to do this. I'm too old to heal. I'm too old to go back and heal my, you know, my three-year-old inner child, or I'm too old to start a new career as a graphic designer, or I'm too old to be a painter. But the truth is you're never too old for any of that stuff. Nope. You know what I mean? I mean, yep. I mean, I might be, and I'm not even too old to run a marathon, quite frankly. I mean, I still got, oh, knees, I... I might not be fast, but I could still do it. You know what I mean? Um, heck, I mean, you got people that that are in wheelchairs that do marathons. So the point well, being the point. is that you're never too old for anything. I think where where we run into problems is when our mind tells us and gives us that excuse, well, you can't. You know, and, and as soon as your mind says you can't, you might as well just hang up your shoes and be done with it because right there it's you're 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 burning you're burning your own bridge you know needlessly needlessly right so so what's what's really really special i think with with allison's um with allison's program and this is a change that i'm that i'm that i've noticed over the last year is she's starting to draw folks that are a lot younger than what you would think um right now we've probably got three or four folks that are under 21 in the group. Oh, really? Yes. Which is when you think about it, quite an amazing thing because, you know, when you think back to when you're 19 or 20 years old and we were just talking about that and how difficult it is for boys or girls to go through that process of learning who we are, because really, I'm not even sure if I even know who I am and I'm 57, but you know, going going back and looking when I was 21, I mean, oh my, the decisions I were making, Kevin, were terrible decisions, right? But that was only because I didn't know any better. But if if I had the training that I'm getting now when I was that age, then most likely I would be making much better decisions and I wouldn't be feeling and having the thoughts that I'm having now, now. So yeah. no, that makes perfect sense. You know, yeah. So these folks that are, that are, that are, that are taking that leap of faith and starting early. Um, and I'm seeing some amazing progress already with some of these, these, these younger folks that are already starting to get it and they're starting to apply them to their lives now. And I can just imagine the caliber of these people and, and what they're going to be like when they're in their 30s, their 40s and their 50s. That, that's, that's really where the future of America lies, is not in any old young person. I mean, nothing against the, the younger generation because they're, they're unique, just like we were unique uh, you know, when our parents were our age. But I think those folks that are really willing to examine themselves and start to heal some of their trauma early or at least recognize it and 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 make some changes based on different tools and techniques those are the folks that are going to make a huge difference and that's where a lot of this change is going to take place oh i i, I agree yeah. completely it's um we've got um a lot of a lot of young kids are there's a there's a change happening at mm -hmm. least i i feel it and i've noticed it there is a change happening in in the young people that are growing up. They seem to be a lot wiser than we were when I was growing up. And I don't know why. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, 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 I don't exactly know why either, but I do tend to agree with you. I think that there's something that they're sensing that a whole bunch of us might have missed somewhere. Well, and you know, and it's not, it's not so much even that, that we should be ashamed or that we should feel badly because we missed it. It was because it just wasn't up. It wasn't possible for us because nobody, nobody was talking about this stuff the way, the way that you are now and right. the way we are now. And it's, it really is um, an important aspect of who we are well yeah maybe maybe that's a that's definitely a better way of putting it and and as much as i dislike some of the trends on social media on the other hand there is the advantage of expanding communications and expanding that cult cultural awareness which we didn't have you know i think that we were i mean my exposure for example to other cultures as a kid 
literally was National Geographic magazine. Yeah. You know, I mean, I got my first exposure to Stonehenge, to Africa, to Egypt by looking at the foldouts in National Geographic. Well, you're, you, you know, you're, you're a decade younger than I am, but I, I remember there used to be something in school that was called an encyclopedia. Oh yeah. Yeah. And there was a whole row of those. And mm -hmm. that's what you, when I, I went to a school where you had two grades in the same classroom, okay. fifth and sixth grade and seventh and eighth grade. And so when they were teaching the seventh graders, I would go over and get an encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned back then. I learned how to read and, and I learned about history and all of those things. And uh, now kids have got so much information at their disposal and i think it's it's changed and, and it is and it's a positive change it's also a negative change so i i really don't honestly know how to feel about it well i mean I, well yeah you're right yeah it's it's definitely a dual-edged sword but you know going going to the positive side i mean a, the encyclopedia is a great example national geographic is a great example but those are the are, are one-way pushes of information right Right. So you want to learn about something, you go, you pull it out, you read about it. But I think the benefit today is that if I wanted to, if I wanted to know more about, I don't know, Nigeria or Zaire or, you know, Ireland, I literally can go on my phone right now, find somebody who lives there and strike up a chat. Yeah. And, and get a live video like right now. You know what I mean? And that is a very powerful thing. Um, and the same, I think, applies to world events. Now, we do and, and tend to get sucked into the bias of the news, right? I mean, I haven't been because I pretty much turn that to the off position. Um, however, if you really want the ground truth about anything, you can bypass the news and go directly to those that are there and really speak to them. You know what I mean? And that, that is power right there. And I think when you're young, you're motivated and you really want to make change in a positive way and you use those tools, then you really understand what's going on in the world. And, and the, all that other stuff then just becomes background noise. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't need that anymore. I can go talk to Kevin who lives in Seattle and find out exactly what the hell is going on in downtown Seattle. Why, why would I need to turn on Fox CNN or any of that other stuff? Exactly. And, 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 yep. I agree. Um, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful world we live in. It really, it really can be. And, and the information age is here to stay and it's, it's, it's important. Yeah. Um, but, but you're right. Um, we can do, you know, what I see in Seattle anyway, cause I'm not everywhere. But what I see is young people that have a different attitude about um, about race. They have a different attitude about about uh, sexual orientation and all of that stuff. Then it's different than it, than it used to be, and and they have a much broader. So I think it's really cool that there's some young people that are working with Allison because they're going to get a head start over everything that we. Because I we I didn't figure any of this out until I was like forty two. Yeah, that's what it's because it's like you were saying, we didn't have exposure to it. We didn't have uh, the we didn't have it laid out for us. We, we didn't even know there was options in some particular cases. You know, when you're when you're when you're taught a certain way, that's the only reality, you know, you only know what you're taught. I mean, honestly, unless yep. unless you're literally going someplace to learn it firsthand, you only know what your authority figures teach you. I had, you know, and this goes back 20 years, but I had no idea about meditation, about, about quieting your mind and, and all the practices that, that, um, uh, Allison works with and teaches and what you're learning and, and are beginning to teach as well, which that's gotta be exciting for you that you are now in a place where you are an author and you're a speaker and you're getting to the point where you're going to be able to uh, impart your knowledge to other people. That has to make you feel powerful and, and fulfilling. Well, it, 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 it's, it's with great, res with great responsibility, you know, it's, it's, you have to just be humble with that because like anything, you only know what you know, and you only know your own personal perspective on things. Right. So I'm always very cautious 
about what I say um, because I certainly would never want to lead somebody down the right path. I'm not a coach by any stretch of the imagination, right? And I would never proclaim to be a coach. Um, I leave the coaching to the professionals, right? And however, 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 if somebody says, hey, John, what do you think? Um, I don't mind sharing my perspectives on things, right? Um, I'd like to think that having been alive for this long, I, you know, maybe know one or two things, you know. Just say that. <laughs> uh, you know more than just one or two things. <laughs> like, like I said, it would be great if we knew what we knew now and worked yeah. to be a teenager again. Um, yeah. But earlier today, I interviewed a gentleman by the name of David Essel, mm -hmm. and he has been a thought leader for like 40 years and has like 12 books out and stuff. And we talked about what it was like in the 80s and 90s to be part of the new thought movement that didn't really exist at the time. Right. And he was like... He stuck with it over over that period because he felt very strongly about what he believed about. And it's amazing that people are willing to do that and to hang with what they believe because they know it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you if anything that you feel passionate about, anything that you feel connected to, um, it's very hard to shake from it. Right. Even 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 if the rest of the world is saying dude, that's like the dumbest idea you ever heard. If you're passionate about it, I mean, I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? That's why people do what they do. That's why, that's why I stuck with the Coast Guard for so many years. I mean, um, you know, my story basically is I joined the Coast Guard because I felt um, that I had to rescue my first wife and my child from poverty. I mean, cause I had gotten married right out of high school oh, wow. and my daughter was born within six months of that. And I didn't have a job. You know, I mean, I literally went to the yellow pages and picked the Coast Guard out, not knowing what the heck I was getting myself into. And it wasn't supposed to be a 36 year career. It was going to be a four year obligation. Right. Um, but obviously that turned out a little bit different. But what I found with the Coast Guard, just like with any kind of passionate pursuit, is that there are some things that really end up becoming very meaningful because they have such a great impact and they could potentially have a great impact. So something like, like the gentleman you're referring to there, I can definitely see that um, where that idea or that belief is, is either so very strong or it just makes so much sense that at some point somebody's going to say, Hey, this is going to be a thing and then I'm just going to keep following it. Right. So it makes sense to me. You know, I think that we need to make a rule that kids are not allowed to get married right out of high school. How do you, how do you, how do you have any idea? You're still a child yourself. How, can, how, how do you grow up when you're in your late teens? I mean, in my high school, we had a bunch of people get married right out of high school. There are two couples, two couples that are still left mm -hmm. after, after 40 years. Everybody else is in their second, third or fourth relationship and, and that sort of thing. And it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change any of it. I mean, well, certainly not your daughter. Yeah. Well, I mean, even the, even the relationship, I mean, I don't, I don't even know if my first wife would even argue with me with that. I think that there's value in everything that we do. Uh, yep. Even even if we That's find true. out that the decisions weren't the best because of our youth or whatever, I think that we both learned something important about ourselves from that. And although, um, you know, um, we probably could have made better decisions up front, I think there are certain behaviors that I did not repeat because of that. Um, of course, I ended up getting married a second time and did repeat that behavior again. So I wasn't exactly perfect on my side of the aisle. Well, but, you know, the, the, thing, the thing is life is, an exp is a experience and it is designed to be that. Yeah. So that we can learn everything that we came here to do and came here to learn over time. Yeah. It's, it, and so it's important, whatever that experience is, that you, that, and you know, we talk a lot about grief and we talk a lot about um, uh, uh, PTSD and, and being unhappy and that kind of stuff. We've, but the, our experiences are what makes us unique and makes us special. It is. And you know what? I'm really glad you mentioned that because I just had this thought that I wanted to, to bring up really quick is that one of the things we also need to learn is to unlearn behaviors. Yes. And what I, and what I mean by that specifically is I don't know how often folks talk about this, but 
you know, we are also products of our upbringing, right? We're products of our parents. We're products of our teachers. Uh, a lot of that. So, so what I'm saying is a lot of who we are is based on other people's perceptions of who they wanted us to be. Right. So we end up becoming or demonstrating, you know, um, uh, characteristics of our fathers, of our mothers, of our friends, right? And oftentimes we don't even know that we're doing that. So sometimes we need to unlearn those behaviors. Yep. Right. One, and, yep. Yeah. So I think that's something that we should think about too. So not only not only learning from our past mistakes, for example, but also maybe considering. And I think Allison uses this example a lot. Um, do we really like the foods that we eat or are we eating the foods that we eat because we were taught to eat them? <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you like Brussels sprouts, Kevin, or are you only eating them because your dad ate Brussels sprouts? You know what I mean? Questions like that. Um, I mean, it's just something to think about. Um, well, I, I got a good example for you. Yeah. Um, when I was in high school, I was a baseball player and I was also a football player. And uh, in my home, when I was growing up, my mother, regardless of how good we did at something, mm -hmm. she would always throw in a butt at the end of that. Mm -hmm. It was always, well, you did this really well, but you could have done this better and this. Could. And I asked her years later why she did that. And she said, well, I didn't want you to get a big head. Uh, wanted to keep us in check. And so I took it the attitude that um, it wasn't ever good enough because regardless of how well I did, I'll give you an example. I was uh, playing right field on the baseball team and there was a guy at second base and there's a high fly ball hit to right field fairly deep. And the guy at second base tagged up at second base to run to third base. Well, I had a strong arm. And so I th threw it to third base and we threw him out. And so we got him out, and then we went back to, to the dugout. And so the coach came by, and he said, uh, that was a great throw. And instead of saying, thanks, coach, I appreciate it, I said, yeah, but I missed the cutoff, man. So I was not, I was, it was so ingrained in me to do something, to say something that was self-depreciating, even though it was a great thing that I did, I couldn't accept the fact that it was, and just leave it at that and say, thanks, coach. Appreciate it. Right. Um, and that that's something that has followed me for a long time. And it, it wasn't until like five years ago that I figured out, aha, yep. that's why I would do that. Yeah. Because it used to drive me crazy. Yeah. That's exactly why. That's exactly why. It's a learned behavior. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's a shame that that happened, but that, I think it happens a lot. I think that that's not an uncommon story. I mean, and it, it really is difficult for some of us um, to just respond with a thank you. Yeah. And, yeah. Th and that is a learned response Yeah, that, that we have to recognize that they're not blowing smoke right. or they're not, they're not saying it just to be nice, that they actually mean it yeah. and that we should accept it. Yeah. Somebody says, Hey, Kevin, you look really nice tonight. Uh, thank you. Yeah. But. I don't know. This doesn't look right on me or yeah, but does, does my butt look too big or yeah, this does, this, should, does this tie too small? You know what I mean? We, we do tend to do that um, instead of just taking that appreciation for what it is, which is just somebody admiring the way you look. It's simple. Thank you is exactly what you need to say. And you know what I love about these conversations sometimes is they, they go round robin and mm -hmm. go back to where we started because yeah. you're, I'm sure that after you finish your speech, because it wasn't exactly planned out exactly the way, and it wasn't perfect the way that you planned it, that the first thing that you said when somebody, or thought <clears throat> at least, when somebody said, um, John, that was a heck of a speech. You did a wonderful job. I'm sure your first response was, yeah, but is that, is that true? Oh yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't let that go right away. It, it took, but, but to my credit, uh, the old me, I probably would have stewed on that for days. Uh, but I, I probably let that go the next morning. 
Well, and then Jennifer says, by the way, Jennifer, you need to call me. We need to get you on the show again. I completely identify with your butt story. That's what I did too for years. And then she, and then she says, yep, that's exactly what you did. It yeah. was like, yeah, I could have done, you know, but, but the fact of the matter is you did exactly what yeah. you were designed, what it was designed to end up with and, uh, and right. stuff. And, and you, and you really had an impact on people. Yeah. Yeah. As did everyone. It just, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, um, it, it, it is a very difficult thing to do when you're not used to it. It's difficult when you've grown up in environments like yours, where there's always these conditions uh, or these added bonuses of the butt, right? It's a butt bonus. Yes. It sounds funny when I say it, but um, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, because it, because it's an, it's an ass thing. It's, it's, it's not, it yeah. should not be, we should never, we should never follow a compliment with a butt. Because it makes a butt out of you and me. Because it, it needs to be, yeah. yeah, it needs to be. If if you're going to make a compliment, it should be a positive thing, and um, and just let it sit there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what it ought to be. Because you're right, people don't say compliments for nothing. They 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 tend to mean them, and if they don't mean them, you pretty much can tell just by the tone of their voice if they're being sarcastic or something. You will know if it's not a legitimate compliment. And or they won't say a thing or they won't say a thing. Exactly. And it, but when some when you have an impact on somebody and it's a positive impact and they feel compelled mm -hmm. to say thank you right. or that was great or what a wonderful dinner you made. Uh, it, it should be just, well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. You know, that's 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 what we should all do. But we don't do that because we're trained. Yep. What's their motive? What's the, your ulterior motive yeah. for uh, for saying that? Yeah. So, so but, yeah. But that's why we all need a coach. Yep. Yeah. Trust is a big thing, and trust is something that. Um, I mean, it's 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 hard to earn trust. It's hard to to trust other people sometimes, and a, and I think, of course, a lot of us we do tend to feel that we're betrayed quite often, either by people that we know, people that we love, or even the world around us. Right. It's very hard to trust anything anymore. At least that's what it feels like sometimes. Um, but I would argue that a lot of that is all smoke and mirrors. I think that when it comes to other people, uh, in, in my life anyway, um, it's, I've had very, I don't even know if I could think of one person that I've ever had, uh, that deep of a betrayal from, you know what I mean? Um, and maybe I've just been fortunate in my life, but I think generally speaking, uh, the majority of the people I've ever met have always had my best interest in mind. Um, whether or not we ever got along or whether or not we stayed married or whether or not whatever, um, there was very rarely any ulterior motives other than just people being people. So, you know, it does beg the question, is a lot of our trust issues um, real or are they just make believe right so and the reason i bring that up is because you know when you do do this type of work and you start to think about your thoughts and question your belief systems and you really start to dig into that it it those are good questions to ask right maybe you're not a trusting person because your parents weren't trusting people which goes back to what i was speaking to earlier maybe that is a behavior that you were taught Right. Mm -hmm. uh, which then affects your relationships now. Right. Um, and just by examining that one simple thing and just telling and just changing that thought and that belief, if the belief it has been that you don't trust people because your parents never trusted anyone, maybe the answer is, is you just change that belief and then you start to trust people and then your relationships get better. Your money story gets better. Your everything starts to get better. Right. So it's it's this this ripple effect that these things can have on you just by, you know, making a pivot. Right. Um, but trust is a big thing as well. No, I, I agree hundred percent. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that always um, interests me is that we will interpret, interpret what somebody is telling us in the view of how we want it to be or where our past says it should be rather than 
what they actually said, what they actually meant. And so if we have a, as an example, a poor image of ourselves, Mm -hmm. then we are going to look at it from that lens rather than a legitimate compliment or a legitimate, that was a very nice thing to say. You know what I mean? Right. Well, we, we, we take everything, we take everything personally. We we do. And of course I'm making a, a huge generalization there, but I think we kind of do. We we tend to absorb everything from the outside and we internalize it to make it about us when the fact is that's not true. That's, you know, that's true. Oh, the, yeah. world, the world, I mean, and I think you've you've mentioned this before in some of your podcasts. I mean, the world isn't out to get you, Kevin. No. You know, the Russians aren't out to get you. You know, the president isn't out to get you, right? The guy that's living in the na- the, the house next door is not out to get you. You know, I mean, there are people in the world that might be, but the odds of that actually happening are infinitesimal. You know what I mean? Um, the same thing with um, uh, other people's perceptions of you, right? Whether they have opinions of you or not is quite frankly, none of your business. That's got nothing to do with you. That's got to do with them, right? What they think about you is their problem. It's got nothing to do with you. You are who you are. Unless you're not because you don't know who you are. And that's that's why, you know, a lot of us run into that that issue of, you know, we we perceive ourselves differently than other people perceive us. It, it's it's the darndest thing because yeah. uh, we it's we don't perceive ourselves as be, other people think more of us than we think of ourselves and that's a real problem and, and we can and we can work to fix that and what yes. I mean by fix that I mean change that perception because I think you're absolutely right I think we do we we tend to lowball ourselves a lot for one thing um, you know I'm I'm never going to be a great artist, even though everybody around me says I do great pictures and paintings of fish. I don't think they're that great, but everybody likes them. So why why is my opinion of my fish so low? Right. So that's clearly something that I need to work on. Right. So that's a matter of, that's a self-esteem issue. That's a self care or a self approval issue. That's, that's all this different stuff. And it all kind of goes back to the trauma that I experienced growing up, right? Whether or not it was from childhood or later on in adolescence or even in my early years, right? Why do I feel like that, right? What are the thoughts behind that? What was the actions that might have resulted from something that 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 changed my worldview about that particular thing? And when you look at that and you examine it and you start to heal that, that's when you start to change yourself. And that's when things start to align, and even if they don't align, again, at least you can come to the realization that it doesn't really matter what other people think about you. The important thing, Kevin, is that you love yourself. The important thing is that you realize that you realize you have that self power, right? You are you are you are your own world. Yeah, you know, honestly, you are. Every, and 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 when people say, "Geez, Kevin, what is this all about you?" Well, the answer ought to be, "Well, yeah, it is." At the end of the day, I mean, at the end of the day, it is. I mean, it's this is the only life you're going to be given, Kevin. So if you're going to spend your whole life people pleasing or feeling bad about yourself or, you know, trying to do everything you can to make other people happy, well, number one, you're never going to make anybody else happy because happiness is an internal thing. Um, number two, you know, you doing it for everybody else and not for yourself then you're going to sit back when you're 99 years old and you're taking your last breath going, well, what the crap? I just missed out on all this stuff I could have been doing, you know? Yep. And and you know, what's interesting, John, is that you just, and you just said it with your paintings, your paintings are amazing. What you do is, is just remarkable. I could not do what you do regardless of how hard I tried to get at it because you have a gift. But it's easy when you have a gift to downplay your gift because you can do it well and it comes easily to you. So therefore, it's not as big of a gift as if somebody else, if, if when you look at somebody else, you could maybe be a songwriter or a singer or something like that. You say, they've got a great gift. Hey, my gift is okay. You know what I mean? But your gift is as good and as, as, as important as anybody else's gift. We just downplay it because it comes easy for us. 
Well, yeah, it, it comes easy for us. And then we, like you were saying, we just have different perceptions of ourselves. So it's like what you do, what you do, I can't do, or I could do, but it would nearly, it wouldn't nearly be as good as how you do it. Right. And you know, the first thought that comes to my head just yeah. innately when you said that is, mm -hmm. oh, come on, John, it's easy. Everybody can do what I do. And everybody can do the paintings that I do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. but, but I mean, what I'm saying is I'm agreeing with you here. I think it's, it, it goes back to what we were saying, right? It's, and, and what I'm saying, it's, it's, it's understanding how important each of us are and that what we're able to provide to us for ourselves and for other folks, it doesn't really matter what other people think of it, because if we're happy with it, the rest is going to follow. So if I can get to the point and I'm working on, it, I really am working on it to get to the point where I can do a piece of art that I don't really care whether or not Kevin McDonald likes it or not, because I like it. Mm -hmm. Then, then that's exactly where I need to be because now I'm doing it because I love to do it. And because I have that passion instilled into it, there will be people that want that art. And if it's yeah. not for you and if it's not for her and it's not for him, that's okay. But there are people that want it. Same thing with your podcast, right? You're, right? You have a specific audience and this other guy here might not want to listen to it because he prefers true crime or something. Well, that's on him. That ain't on you. Right. Got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with you. Right. So um, that's, that's really where we all need to be because once we realize that, then we're all going to be, we're going to ramp up a huge quantum notch in happiness because now we're finally doing those things that bring us happiness and we don't have to worry about that other stuff because it doesn't matter. I have to say that I don't know, John, that if there would be two guys having a conversation like this anywhere else in podcast land or anywhere else in the world, because, you know, you're, you're, you're very competent and very good at what you do. And we can have a conversation like this. It means something. And that's that's what is important for me. And I, the way I look at it is my job is to is to shine a light on you and to do something together with you and to create something great. And it's up to the universe to find people who want to listen to it. Yeah. Not my job. Nope. Nope. And if they if they need to hear it, they'll find it. If they don't, that's OK. Exactly. And I, I can't have an ego around it no. because it's not that's not what it's all about. Hey, you got you got one listener right here, so that's. Well, you know what's interesting is, I got to tell you, John. Uh, you know, the audience is growing and people that are finding us, but because I don't do these consistently at the same time every time, mm -hmm. you've had you've had more people listening to us today than the by far the normal. Oh, really? Oh, wow. wow. Yes, indeed, and part of that's because you guys have got such a tight knit group. Uh, that work with Allison and that you are so supportive of each other, which is really important. But there are others that are listening and they're staying with it because the information that you and I are figuring out is important. Great. I, I'm so happy to hear that. that that's wonderful. It really makes me very happy. Thank you. Well, as well, you should be. Now, what's the next, you know, you're going to do behind the power next year. What's your chapter going to be about? Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that chapter is going to look like yet. Um, I met with Allison uh, the final day of the Behind the Power event because I was super excited to try this again. Um, I thought my chapter for this book turned out really well. I think my speech, as we talked about, turned out pretty well. And I know that I have a lot more personal work that I need to do this year. Uh, what I really want to focus on for me is resolving some of my historically uh, misidentified anger issues. I think a lot of the anger issues that I've suffered throughout a lot of my younger years that, that led up into my, you know, into my thirties and forties were really based on some significant childhood trauma that I'm only recently uncovering. Um, mm. Some things that I didn't even know existed. Um, they at the time didn't seem very significant. However, the more I'm looking at them, the more I'm thinking that they're a lot larger than I thought, or, or they impacted me for a lot longer of a period of time. So I want to focus in more on that. So 
that's really going to be my focus for this year. And during that, whatever falls out, I'm not quite sure chapter wise. Uh, I don't know what the subject matter is specifically going to be. Some folks had suggested maybe speaking a little bit about, um, you know, the actual transition part from the military to the civilian side and some of the emotional uh, fallout from that, because that was a very difficult period for me. And I know there's a lot of veterans specifically that have gone through even more significant trauma just making that transition. Um, that could be an option. Um, but I don't know. I can certainly keep you in the loop as we move forward and let you know how that goes. Well, would you make me two promises? Number one is uh, that you will return to this show often. Sure. Absolutely. And, uh, and the other one is that I really like the concept of, of doing that transition. It affects every, hmm. not every, but most men on the planet. Hmm. It, it impacted my father greatly. It impacted me greatly. Um, because as you go from being, I mean, I, I traveled the country, I had a company credit card, I flew on airplanes, I talked to vice presidents and, and of, of restaurant chains and companies and, and, and could at the, at a drop of a hat, get people to go out to dinner with me and we'd spend several hundred dollars, drop the credit card, nobody cared and all that kind of stuff. I was pretty, pretty hot stuff back mm -hmm. then. <laughs> and I ended up as a bus driver in Seattle, talking to the bottom three percent of the company or the, of the uh, population. Mm -hmm. And uh, and but so there's a transition that we all have to have to go through. Yeah. And the same thing happened with my dad. Same thing happened to you after 36 years yeah. in in the military. I think that would be. F and then figuring out what you're going to do with yourself to keep yourself alive and be meaningful. Yeah, that yeah, I, that that probably would be a really good subject to investigate. I've known, I think, over the course of my career, I've known probably half a dozen folks that, you know, retired after thirty years of service and within that first six months passed away. So, it does happen, and unfortunately, it happens probably more often than people know, and that's because it's such a significant shock to the system. They just people tend to feel worthless. Um, on the veteran side, uh, especially those that see combat, it's even worse. You know, it's oh, yeah. just it is, there's a higher rate of suicide. There's a higher rate of of drug abuse and everything else. And it's it's an unfortunate side effect of that type of situation. So, yeah, it might be might be really worth my time to really dig deep into that and, and investigate that a little bit more. There is a ton of stuff that goes along with it, including the suicides, including the um, the the drug abuse and the alcohol abuse and all of that. When you no longer have anywhere to go, and and oh, and also marital issues. Um, oh, that's another one. Yep, yep. Because my my mother and father, my father when he he worked six days a week for Nordstrom for most of his adult life, and then when he came home when he retired. He was now invading her space. Yeah. And and so they they ended up splitting up for for about six months because of that. Right. And uh, and Christine, I it's you could help you could help so many. And I think that's that's really is true. Yeah. That really is true. Yeah. And so I I would I'll help you in any way I can, young man. I appreciate that. So, and you've got a, a good following of people that follow you and you should be very proud of who you are. Thank you. And there's a steps you're working to make changes for yourself. By the way, go to alisonroberts.com and you can find out more about her, her work and the entourage of people that she has that are really, I, I can't tell you how outstanding a group of people you are. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, you can now get the... Behind the Power, You're Not Crazy, Your Powerful Hard Copy Book. Yay. Available on Amazon. It's available on Amazon, and it, it actually sold uh, It sold really well in, in the very beginning. So Yeah, yeah. when we went live in, uh, uh, right before, I think it was a week before the event, it hit, I think, four or five different number one bestsellers on uh, the Kindle version. So we did extremely well that first day. So uh, for, for everyone that did support us and that, that got a copy of the Kindle version, thank you very much, because I guess that means I'm a best-selling author too. Who knew? You need to put that on your resume. I know. I need to add that in there. So folks can see it. <laughs> let's see a uh, artist, best-selling author and 
a uh, speaker. And the speaker, note. yep. A keynote speaker. Exactly. Keynote speaker, yes. There you are. So, uh, John, thank you much for being here. I'm good. Before we go, though, I want you to be able to say to your friends, family, and anybody else that's listening now or in the future, you tell them anything that you'd like them to know. Well, just keep dreaming big, love each other, and don't be afraid to change your mind because not everything you think is true. That's it. Simple. That's it. That's, that's it. And that is, that is so true. Yeah. And, uh, and research everything. Research so, everything. And, oh, and, and happy Halloween, too. Yes, indeed. And, yeah. oh, by the oh, I know what I wanted to mention, too, because Halloween is a precursor to Thanksgiving. Yes. We are going to have an election in next week and stuff, and what I really would like everybody to do is let's put all of that stuff aside. Let's make a commitment not to talk politics at Thanksgiving. Oh. Let's try and work together and bridge the gap that we have as a family or as families so that we can work together to achieve great things, which we can only do if we do it together. I agree. Amen to that, Kevin. That's 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 my soapbox. So there we are. So. Works, works for me. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, John. I really appreciate you coming on and, and you, you're going to have, to, you're going to have to do this again because it's, it's a lot of fun for me. All right. Yeah. If you can count on it, I'd love to do it. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Again, John Cole, thank you very much. And uh, go to, by the way, John, uh, what's your website? Oh, it's John Robert Cole.com. And there's some and stuff you can buy there and some, um, artwork that you can see and, and stuff like that, please, you should go there. And uh, if you have a mind, go buy something. That would be fun. That would be awesome. Yes. And hold on. Somebody made a comment. Um, oh, and. Oh, amen from Christine. All right. Very nice. So thank you so much. And uh, and um, you, John, if you'll stay right there, I'll be right back. Hey, thanks for enjoying this episode all the way to the end. Please give us a like and subscribe to this channel. This has been a production of PositiveTalkRadio.net. Please visit our website, oddly named PositiveTalkRadio.net, for more details about us and our mission, which is to provide great positive programming designed to inspire us all. I'm Kevin McDonald, and I'm proud of these shows, and I truly hope that you'll like them and share them with friends and family. So on behalf of our entire team, remember... Be kind to one another because each other